kind introduction and uh, welcome. Uh, as Grace already said, um, we try to give brief overview on computational proteomics. But as you can imagine, um, we only got like 90 minutes and it's a, it's a huge field. So we are only scratching the surface. So uh, feel free to ask any question at any time. But actually, first, I would like to know who's actually a beginner in the field of computational proteomics. OK, good. So we, and the experts? <laughs> the medium got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thanks. So, um, we nevertheless, we want to go over like the, I think, like kind of important fields of computational proteomics, and there are obviously many more. But you will start with a quick introduction to mass spectrometry based proteomics. Then we talk about identification, uh, quantification, how we can process large data sets using workflow-based proteomics, and then briefly talk about how you can do that in OpenMS, and also how you can use uh, Pi OpenMS. This is basically our Python bindings to OpenMS um, to help you in your research. Um, in so in proteomics, we are generally interested in studying the structure, function, the dynamics and interaction of proteins in complex organisms. And um, the main high throughput technology we use is liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. Um, it has the, basically has the simple idea, the simple two key ideas of these are that we want to separate the analytes using by their physiochemical properties, for example, using chromatography. And then we want to measure the mass or something that is related to the mass of them to basically to then use this information or this data to identify and quantify the individual analytes. So how do we measure proteins? There are several approaches. Um, globally speaking, we can talk about top-down and or native proteomics, where we want to directly analyze the undigested proteins in their native state or denatured state, uh, or we do it after digesting the proteins down into shorter peptides using an enzyme. Um, there's also something in between, uh, middle-down proteomics, which uh, does, for example, does some partial digest. But it's not only how we uh, process, how we do sample processing or process the proteins. There are also many uh, technical aspects. We can, uh, how do we actually measure the data using the mass spec? And there are different flavors. One of them is uh, data independent acquisition, DIA, often abbreviated as DIA, or also the SWOT is related to that, which in an unbiased way will basically scan you hold the, the whole sample mass range in regular fashion and it's pretty unbiased. And Leon will later talk about this and quantification part. Then there's data dependent acquisition, which uh, for example, selects, let's say the 20 highest intensity analytes for, for, the, for the processing in the mass spectrometer. Or there are other targeted methods like for example, MRM, but these are mainly used in, for example, industrial setups that work very well, but are pretty targeted to some analytes of proteins. Uh, so uh, for research, I would say that DIA and DDA, bottom-up proteomics is well established and widely applied, and probably most of you guys here are dealing with. So let's take a look at bottom-up proteomics a bit. So uh, as I pointed out, before we start with digesting protein into smaller peptides using a, an enzyme, for example, trypsin, then we place them into a column. And the analytes get separated based on their physical chemical properties. Well, for example, how hydrophobic they are, for example. Then um, these analytes elute at a certain retention time from the column. They get ionized here, pass through some 
ion optics in a mass spectrometer and get collected. They're then channeled into a mass analyzer. In this case, it's an Orbitrap instrument where the frequency of oscillation is directly related to the mass to charge ratio. So what we get here is basically a value that more or less corresponds to the mass of the analyte or can be used to calculate the mass of the analyte. Um, what the mass spectrometer gives us are so-called mass spectra. And if you look at such a mass spectrum, we basically see a set of peaks and each peak has an intensity value and a mass to charge value, a position. Um, the intensity kind of relates to the abundance of the analyte or the ions that have been measured and the M to C value to uh, the mass to charge ratio. Um, so modern instruments record more than uh, 50,000 spectra in a single run. And if you stack these spectra on top of each other, like each vertical line here would be one mass spectrum, <coughs> you get a so-called peak map, which basically contains all the masses that you recorded of your analytes. And as you can see, such uh, an experiment can be pretty, uh, pretty complex. A lot of stuff is going on here. We might end up with raw files that might be up to like 100 gigabytes in size for some instruments. So how do we actually find out what is in that data? And here, the mass spectrometer um, helps us in further basically taking a close look at the actual mass that has been measured. Uh, in this case, a certain mass gets selected and collected. All other masses that elude at the same time are removed by a mass filter. Then they get fragmented in a collision cell and so-called fragment ions are created. These are just your collected analyte broken into smaller pieces. And these are then measured again in the second round of mass measurement. These are usually called fragment spectra, MS2 spectra, tandem spectra, depending on the context. So if we have such a peptide and then it gets fragmented in the collision cell, these peptides kind of randomly break at certain backbone positions and two fragments are created, the so-called prefix and suffix ions. And many of these uh, fragmentation events basically form this fragment spectrum that we get here. And this allows us later in many cases to identify what we have actually measured in the mass spec. There are different approaches. We will go into detail more on those later. But um, basically, we compare them either to previously identified fragment spectra where we know what has been me measured, or we predict fragment spectra and also calculate theoretical fragmentation uh, spectra, or we do a so-called de novo sequencing, which basically wants to uh, determine the actual peptide sequence based on the fragments directly. Um, this is the first part of protein identification, but to this point we only identified the peptides. And so there's a crucial second step that is to infer the proteins based on the peptides that have been identified. Um, more recently, uh, a pretty old separation technique, uh, which is called eye mobility, has gained much more attention in the field of uh, mass spectrometry. And um, so there now exists like instruments, like this Timstop, that can basically record also the another dimension of separation in the mass spectrometer, which is called like the drift time, which kind of is related to um, how big the molecule is. And as plotted here, you will get much more data, not only uh, mass to charge ratio, but also an eye mobility value. 
And in this case, um, they showed that singly charged peptides or contaminants, like here, can be easily uh, distinguished from uh, higher charged peptides just by combining like master charge and ion mobility. So this is currently a kind of a promising or active research field. And um, other approaches that also exist are uh, like external devices that you can plug into your uh, mass bag that can be used as a filter that basically just improve the quality of the signal that you record in, in your mass bag. So um, there are literally hundreds or thousands of different experimental methods and protocols to identify and quantify uh, proteins. And there are probably as many computational methods uh, for the identification and quantification. And also importantly, um, the statistical analysis of the quantitative data or identification data we get. And often these combinations are closely tailored to an experimental method. And as always, the goal is then to extract the maximum biological knowledge by optimally combining those methods using computational methods. Okay. So we will now take a closer look into protein identification. Uh, are there any questions on the very brief introduction so far? Okay, I think then we continue with Eugen. Okay, so <clears throat> I will first explain um, the different approaches to protein peptide identification in the bottom-up bottom -up proteomics, and then also mention a few um, more complex, more advanced concepts that derive from that or use that. And uh, first of all, the, um, because we're doing bottom-up proteomics, we first need to identify the peptides, and there are no multiple approaches to do that. And from that, we also need to infer then the proteins themselves because we have digested these into the peptides. So the different approaches for identification are uh, start with a de novo search. That is the approach that uh, requires the least amount of uh, prior knowledge. You only essentially assume you know the, know, uh, know the masses of the 20 different uh, residues and you try to kind of assign the mass differences that you see in the fragment spectrum to, um, to these um, amino acid uh, masses and try to sequence it this way. Um, in the spectral library matching, that's kind of the opposite end where you have uh, already experimental spectra that are well annotated with specific peptides and you just want to see in a new data set whether you can find the same peptides again. Here, of course, you need um, uh, already well annotated spectra that are kind of done with the same collision energy on a similar instrument and so on. So here you, uh, and you need to annotate this spectra somehow, so probably we're using one of these other approaches first. And the one that's uh, kind of between these two and um, the most used is a database search. Where you have a target protein database that you assume is in your sample. For example, if you're working with human tissue or cells, you use the human proteome, or you can also specialize that further to a patient-specific database if you know the genetics or something. But generally, you just use um, uh, the organism's proteome. And the general pipeline for this is the upper part, Timo already explained to you, digest the proteins into peptides. You first measure the mass of the entire uh, peptide. Uh, then you make a fragment spectrum from that for uh, peptide fragments. And you can kind of simulate this whole process also in the in silico in the computer. The protein sequences that using the known cleavage rules from the enzyme, uh, proteolysis enzyme, you can get the uh, peptide sequences using the uh, precursor mass, the whole peptide mass. You can filter this list down to a few candidates for each uh, uh, fragment spectrum, and then you generate theoretical spectra just based on the um, amino acid masses, usually, and you score this in the peptide spectrum matches, PSMs. Each one is a special of score, and then you rank them essentially for each spectrum by the score. Usually, you would then only report the one top score ranked for each spectrum, and you have a list of PSMs for the entire data set for every spectrum. So usually the um, theoretical spectra look somewhat like this because we don't, it's not easy to um, 
estimate the intensity of these. So this is usually the um, intensities of the peaks are either just ignored, there's no number attached, or you just take some constant number. As for example, uh, an example of theoretical mm -hmm. spectrum of just singly and doubly charged P and Y ions. And, um, but uh, nowadays there are also some methods to predict ion intensities. Uh, for example, MS2 PIP that uses random forest regression or deep mass prism and prosite using a deep um, neural network. And for example, the search engine IonBots now that can um, they also kind of you give it a database and it predicts intensities as well. And this kind of a thing already in between spectral library search and database search because you can also consider intensities now. And of course, you, you can also do retention time prediction and add a filter on the retention time, not only just on precursor mass to the um, initial candidate filter. And there are also tools available for that, for example, um, OpenMSRT predict uses uh, support vector machines, but also ProSight and uh, DeepRT use deep neural networks to predict these as well. And taking this basic database search approach, this can be extended to more advanced um, different kind of applications and problems. For example, um, phosphorylation modifications. Here, for example, uh, phosphoside or phosphorylation uh, modifications. Um, these are post-translational modifications on the residues that can activate or deactivate enzymes or change the structure in another way. They can be important in biological processes, so it's important to localize them specifically on a specific residue and identify them. And for that, there are specific scoring schemes and specific tools like uh, Phosphor-S and Lucy-4. You can search for these and other post-translational post modifications. There's also glycoproteomics. Here, the problem is that the modifications are just these huge branch tree-like structures of sugars, and there are also um, isobaric sugar um, subunits that can be combined in different ways. So you get much more complex spectra, and that, uh, yeah, there is, I think, no, no really, uh, no automated search databases for that yet. I think that's really worked well. So another type of search that you can do here is, for example, the open modification search. If you want to discover new modifications or you just don't know what modifications are in your data, you can kind of uh, open up the peptide precursor window to uh, a wide, wider range of masses. And then you just assume that the mass difference between the theoretical peptide and the precursor mass is due to some modifications on one of the residues. Um, there are also tools for specific tools for that, like Unsolo and MS Fragrance, and all modification tools are just fast enough to do the search also with an open modification search. There are also, um, sometimes you also have to search for non triptic peptides, either you use a different enzyme that's not as specific, or for example, in immunology, you sometimes have to look for MHC or HLA ligands that are cleaved by a proteosome or something. And there you usually have kind of a restriction on the size of the peptides, but not really on the cleavage rules, specifically on the residues that are cleaved. So there you get more, uh, also bigger search space. And, but um, it has to be done somehow. <laughs> then there are also examples from um, uh, structural proteomics, for example, in protein, protein cross-linking mass spectrometry. We add um, chemical um, covalent bonds between proteins and within proteins to get structural information. And then after digestion, you get a list of linear peptides, but also you get these um, combinations of several peptides that are linked covalently between each other. And that means that your search space is actually for every precursor mass that you have, you have to search for two peptides from anywhere in the database. They're kind of a search square space, or you can also look at it in the way that you have a peptide that is modified by a mass of one residue, but this modification mass is actually just another peptide that you have to sequence as well. Uh, similarly, in protein RNA and DNA cross-linking, you can have a peptide that is linked to an oligonucleotide, and there again, you have a second modific uh, modification mass that depends on the uh, DNA or RNA sequence, and you can have snippets for of up to four or five um, um, nucle nucleic acids usually. And to both of these cases are just very huge search spaces that are difficult to tackle with normal unification engines. And then after you identify this stuff, the next step is um, kind of quality control because all of these PSMs that you get, you might not have the actual targets in the database or some other issue and 
uh, you, you can be sure that every one of those uh, matches are actually uh, correct. So you have to do some false discovery rate estimation and control. And usually in database search, at least, uh, how we do it is we add um, decoys to the uh, target database. So usually you add another database that is just as big as the target database with reversed uh, peptides, um, peptides or proteins, for example. And these decoys then act as bait. And the assumption behind the statistics is that for just a random wrong, essentially random or wrong match, you have uh, the same chance to get the target as you have a decoy sequence. And using that, you can estimate in any specific set of PSMs how much of many of them are probably false discoveries using a simple formula. And um, essentially, you have uh, these two distributions, one for the targets and one for the decoys on the uh, score dimension. And essentially, using this false discovery rate, you can just choose your score cutoff of when you accept your hits depending on what kind of false discovery rate, how sure you want to be in your hits, essentially. So there will always be some kind of, some slice of these that is, uh, that are decoys and probably not uh, correct target hits. Yeah, there are also other um, kind of approaches to this false discovery destination as well. For example, you can explicitly try to model these uh, score distributions uh, by using a mix mixture model. That's what the peptide profit, for example, does. You can then derive other statistics like the uh, posterior error probabilities and derive your FTR from that. Also, um, tools like a percolator can do, use some machine learning to uh, try to um, separate these uh, distributions more from each other and to get more target hits from um, under the same FTR, essentially. And um, there's also some other um, approaches to um, Kind of estimating the error rate, for example, using p-values. Uh, for, for something like that, you need um, to sample a uh, kind of the scores more accurately, the, uh, sample, uh, the score space more accurately. And for example, MSGF plus and this uh, residue evidence score, new, uh, new score in tight and crux, use kind of a negative score with dynamic programming to sample a much new, a bigger peptide third space, for example, the entire peptide space of, um, that fits within the precursor window but more accurately estimate these distributions and derive a more good FDR from that. Then in the uh, last step here, you have to do protein inference because um, uh, usually you will have multiple spectra kind of um, identify the same peptide. And then you also have peptides mapping to multiple proteins. So each of these uh, mappings here will uh, give a kind of evidence for, every, for, its, uh, for the protein that it's mapped to. But if you have multiple proteins that the peptide mapped to, do you um, assign the same level of evidence to each of these proteins? Or do you um, assign a higher evidence level to proteins that have more, more peptides? There are multiple approaches to doing that. Uh, one of them is, for example, to report just the smallest number of proteins that explains all the peptides. But there are all, you can also use quantification data, I think, for example, for, to um, um, estimate this as well to kind of adjust the distributions, probabilities. And with that, I will uh, hand over to Leon, who will talk about quantification. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm going to talk about protein quantification now. Um, we have to split it in two parts. There will be DDA-based quantification and DIA-based quantification. Um, yes, let's have a look. Um, so in protein quantification, uh, what, we're, what the overall goal is, is that we are trying to get some kind of number that describes us how much uh, protein of, that we are interested in is in our sample. And um, so a very uh, simple idea, and there are very different approaches. Um, what we and also what we could do with these numbers is, we might be interested in uh, what's the absolute concentration of that protein in our sample, um, or what is the, for example, and sometimes that's not even possible to get. What's the ratio between that protein and that sample and that one? Um, what are overall changes in the proteome uh, concentration-wise, and especially when you go to um, 
medical research topics, it's usually interesting to find biomarkers for diseases, comparing treatment and control, or yes, looking at time series um, effects. So um, quantification is a, a large topic. <laughs> there are many different types of quantifications. Um, I'm not a specialist on all of these methods here. Um, we will focus on label-free feature-based, which is the most simple and natural way to do quantification. Um, just as a brief outlook, um, absolute quantification, if you want to do that, uh, you actually need to spike in um, uh, standards into your sample that you can, uh, of those you know the concentration, <coughs> so you can actually compare the intensities of these standards with what you're measuring. Um, if you want to do labeled quantification, you need to label your uh, proteins with, for example, isotopes. And then you can compute ratios between the labels and the non labels and come up with uh, quantifications in this way. So, if we want to do label pre quantification, um, as I said, it's the most simple and natural way. Uh, you basically take your sample, um, you spike it into the mass spec, um, and then you derive numbers for your proteins based on what you're measuring. And uh, advantages are that it's uh, cheap because we don't need anything. Um, we don't, uh, I mean, if you would do some kind of labeling, we take the risk that we actually produce also some errors by doing the laboring not complete or in some way. Um, yes, and uh, it's actually easily scalable to multiple samples, which is not necessarily the case for other methods such as TMT or somebody's familiar with that one. Um, disadvantages, uh, we need a high reproducibility for our experiments and um, it's actually quite difficult to derive label-free quantity, quantities in a manual way. So we really need computation and especially also methods for normalization. Um, right, so now I'm going to talk about uh, how we derive these quantities from our raw data. Um, and we do this by, as Timo was explaining, uh, looking at these uh, LCMS maps or peak maps. So what we get out of the instrument is um, mass over charge uh, over the retention time gradient. And for each measurement point, we get some kind of intensity value. So we are actually dealing with these three-dimensional maps. And each uh, peptide leaves us some uh, signal that we, we are calling feature here. And um, precisely, uh, a peptide usually has about three um, isotope uh, masses that are more abundant. So um, what we are dealing with from one peptide would be three different mass signals that elude over a given retention time range. And uh, to derive a quantity for this, we simply integrate this in a three-dimensional way. And then we come up with basically an area under this three-dimensional feature over the retention time and mass. And this is what we can then compare with the other samples. Now, um, if we would do level-free quantifications for a couple of samples, um, the usual workflow would look like something like this. Um, we <coughs> would find these features that I was talking about in all our samples and all its maps. Then um, the first step we would have to deal with is we have to align the maps because every measurement has a different uh, shift in retention time, unfortunately, <laughs> that we can correct for. So we all align them to the same reference. In the next step, we would um, link the features that are common to all samples together and create consensus features. So some of them are shared between all the samples. Some of them might be just shared between two. Next, um, so this was only uh, working on the MS1 level, the precursor level. Um, next, we would need to identify this feature. So we would go to the fragments get the identification and link this to this 
three-dimensional feature. Um, and then we have quantities that we can compare for this peptide across our samples. Um, it gets a bit more tricky though, because um, we are only measuring peptides, right? And um, we want to get quantities for proteins. So Eugen was briefly talking about protein inference. Uh, this would still have to be done to derive the quantities of the proteins from the peptide quantities. Yes, and it's uh, even more uh, complicated when you want to do more sophisticated analysis, such as comparisons across your samples, you would need to uh, calculate statistical significance or fold changes. And there are lots of software tools, such as, for example, MS Stats and R package, or the classical uh, Perseos from the Max Quant environment that you could use for this. So, second part DIA. Um, the problem is when you do DDA, uh, is that what you get in the end is usually something like this, which is here you have the samples, and those would be proteins and intensities, but you don't measure the same proteins in every sample. So if you want to um, compare fold changes, but you just didn't measure the protein in that sample, you run into a problem. So SWARS DIA offers a way to be more reproducible across samples and fill this matrix uh, to a much larger extent. And this is, of course, uh, totally necessary if you want to do comprehensive studies. Um, just as a brief outline how it works. Um, again, we have our peak map. In DDA-based quantification, we would end up with something like this. So the fragmentation events, where we get the peptide fragments, are triggered based on MS1 intensities, so kind of randomly scattered around our peak map. If we would do DIA, uh, we basically divide the, the entire peak map into a grid and um, fragment the entire peak map in reoccurring windows. And this way we can actually try to fragment everything in our peak map, not just the specific precursors with high intensities and do that in a reproducible way. So here, another look on this, um, you get these precursor isolation uh, swath windows that now can include uh, several precursors at the same time, which make them a bit more complex. However, they cover the entire map. Now, if you want to derive uh, peptide identifications from these stacks of, um, of uh, fragmentation spectra, we can actually look at fragmentation over time. So um, we can find peak groups that elude at the same time of fragments, and those correspond then to our peptides. In contrast to DDA, we can then also evaluate the quantity based on the, the area under this curve of the fragments, the sum basically. And in order to deconvolute these complex um, spectra, we need something like a spectral library or de more sophisticated deconvolution methods. Um, right, there are methods such as this open swath workflow, uh, which are open source that take you through the entire data analysis of DIA data. And uh, just as a brief outline, what is important is that when you analyze this data, you need to find the peak, of, peak groups that are actually co looting at the same time. So you need to score them in a sophisticated way that you can differentiate those kinds from random assignments. So in summary, um, once again, DDA, uh, we are having single uh, nicely triggered MS2 spectra that we identify with in silico spectra and we quantify based on these features. In DIA, um, we have swap windows to fragment the entire LCMS map. And then we identify peptides based on 
elution profiles, and we do that using spectral libraries. And with this, I hand over to Janos, who's going to talk about OpenMS. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, looks good. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I hope you can bear with me for the last uh, part. Um, the most scientific part is over now. We will uh, look at computational proteomics at a, from a more high level point of view now. Uh, we will be talking about workflows, about software development, uh, software maintenance a little. Um, why do we need this at all like why why can't we just uh, look at our data manually and uh, figure out what's in there it's just that the huge amount of data that we have nowadays um, mass spectrometers get faster and faster um, more labs have a mass spectrometer and um, just analyzing all the data is very tedious In trust me in the beginning people were actually looking at their spectra and we're measuring the distances between the peaks manually, trying to figure out um, what amino acid this represents now. Um, you could still do it for maybe one sample if it's like really vital to uh, have the correct peptide, if you want to convict someone of a crime or uh, something like this. But if you, if you have more than one sample, you can already forget this. And even with uh, algorithms, if they are not automatable, if they only run in the, with a the user interface, um, analyzing 20 or more samples is already very tiresome. So what you usually would like um, are tools that can be automated and you want to chain them into workflows that fit your needs so that you can analyze your high throughput experiments, uh, preferably on a, a high performance computing environment in the cloud or um, something which scales much better than manpower. Uh, what you would like to have in the end is probably something like this, uh, what we call the holy grail in bioinformatics. Um, probably a lot of experimentalists see it this way. Uh, they would like to have from us bioinformaticians um, like one pipeline where they give us the data uh, probably in a hard drive um, and they want their supplementary material for their nature publication in the end. And they just press the button and it comes out. Um, we, I think the community tries the best to do it, to make it possible, but I'm not sure if we are there yet and that there's always stuff to do. Um, also, I think it's not very feasible to provide like one uh, Swiss army knife of proteomics in one workflow. What you probably want to have um, is like a, a tool shed of um, a tool set of tools uh, that you can chain into a workflow that fits uh, your specific needs because as we have heard already uh, with all those quantification strategies all those different experimental setups um, all the differences in the mass spectrometers that you can have you um, you would need a lot of parameters in one workflow to make it work on everything um, so usually a single workflow is not enough and that's why uh, it's usually preferred to have uh, modular frameworks, as we call them, uh, or tool sheds um, that provide you with a set of tools that um, if you know how to use them and how to change them, and if they all work together through, let's say, uh, standardized file formats, uh, then you can chain them together in the way you like to do. The only downside is sometimes that it's hard to, hard to learn how those tools get to be used, like how you have to chain them, uh, which tools are out there, how can you find them. Um, but this is also a, a bit solved by those modular frameworks because at least inside those frameworks, usually all, it's made sure that all tools work together, of course. And, um, most of them, if they work on the open PSI file format, they also work interchangeably between each other. Um, one of them, uh, those modular frameworks is OpenMS. Um, yeah, little disclaimer, you heard already, like we are the developers uh, of this, so, but we still try to keep it uh, in an unbiased way. Um, 
uh, just like some brief uh, stats about OpenMS. It's open source in a, and uh, published in a BSD3 clause license. So if you want to use it um, or even use it commercially, you can do that. Um, it's portable. Uh, it's tested on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. So no restrictions there. Uh, with the file formats that I mentioned that are a very important part uh, in workflow-based proteomics, uh, we also support, um, uh, I think, all of the PSI standard formats in uh, mostly complete way. Uh, not all of them are probably 100% implemented. Um, it's, it started as a software library with functions classes, data structures for um, mass spectrometry analysis. But by now, um, like every student that works on OpenMS usually also contributes a tool uh, using this library, uh, such that we uh, accumulated over 180 tools by now that can be used in uh, different workflow systems uh, that are like emerging from the ground these days. Um, uh, so I just wanted to mention some of them from which we know that they were used with OpenMS. Um, there is uh, Topaz, which was in the beginning our own workflow system before we realized that it actually, since so many people are putting so much effort in uh, designing new workflow systems, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to uh, still develop an own one. There is uh, Galaxy. Uh, which you probably know, there's this Galaxy minus P server, which is specialized in proteomics, for example. Um, NIME, which um, started out in chem informatics and actually developed into a, uh, yeah, a, a very versatile uh, workflow system with a graphical user interface that is also used uh, in financial, uh, big financial companies. Um, there is Nextflow, uh, like a script-based open source uh, workflow engine that also has its own uh, little design language for workflows. Uh, Snakewake, which is uh, a Python-based workflow language that um, that got its um, uh, its beginnings from those make files that you usually usually write for other like C or C++ programs. Um, and there's uh, one uh, effort right now to try to um, unify all those workflow languages. It's called this common workflow language. And it also, since it's standardized, there are uh, multiple implementations to it in, in different languages. And um, this can also be used. Um, about the UPO PSI standard formats. Uh, PSI stands for the Proteomics Standards Initiative, and um, they have at least one annual meeting every year, um, if not more. Um, and they they try to keep um, the standards up to date with the uh, growing needs of the proteomics community. And um, just uh, some of their formats that they defined and that are regularly updated are MZML. Um, everyone that works in proteomics and has already worked a little bit in there will know it. It's a um, uh, successor of empty data and it's, it's basically used to store the raw um, spectra of that come out of the mass spectrometer. Not raw in the sense of uh, being a vendor um, encrypted, usually encrypted binary format, but raw in the sense of uh, you have um, potentially base 64 encoded spectra in there. Um, MZ Identum L is um, also a Markov language based file format for storing peptide and protein identifications. Um, there is, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, also MZ Quantum L uh, for quantitative data, and it's, um, it's more human readable. Uh, brother, MC Tab, uh, which is often used for summary informations that come out of the end of a workflow so that uh, people can read it in 
the usual CSV style um, or TSV style to report quantitative and qualitative results. Um, there is also tra uh, transition ML for uh, transitions in a, a data independent or um, uh, in a targeted um, experiment. QCML for storing uh, quality control information. So you can include pictures, for example, there, but also um, yeah, other qu uh, quality control metrics. Uh, yeah, obviously the advantages of such file formats are that they are open, documented, they are kept, uh, they're being updated and uh, should still be readable in like 10 years, which we can't say about the uh, vendor uh, file formats, which might just get dropped with the next version of their instrument. Um, they are interoperable with different software packages. Uh, because usually the proteomics community picks up those new versions quickly and um, usually also uh, new, new tools are developed to support these formats. Um, the disadvantages are, of course, that you need, in the beginning, always need to convert it first into this, let's say, MZML, which is usually your starting point. Um, this can be automated. Uh, usually very easily like often you have a computer already attached to your mass spec instrument and this already does the conversion for you um, there are also new um, conversion tools for example thermo opened up their api for reading their um, their instrument format uh, a bit better so there are uh, new converters out there um, yeah so this this is one advantage, disadvantage. The file size is another one because the markup language is easy to parse for computers and um, easy to generate readers for them, but it's quite verbose and a bit bloated uh, since you uh, repeat the tags in the file all the time. Um, and yeah, if you want to use the instrument software, the companies usually don't have any um, advantage by supporting those file formats. So um, they usually want you to use the, the instrument one. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I think so too. Um, and about the workflows that are enabled by uh, such open file formats, and those uh, tools that uh, I mentioned before. They also facilitate uh, reproducible and reusable research. Um, it, a workflow in general is typically modeled as a directed graph um, where the nodes are the tools that you use and the connections, the edges in between them is the data flow, so like the files that you pass or the channels or the, the, the streams depending on which platform and which implementation. And um, the task of a workflow system is usually the construction of, this, of a workflow. This can be visually or through a, a well-defined workflow language and the execution of it. Sometimes it's uh, those tasks uh, merge a little bit. Sometimes they're kept very separate in different workflow systems. Uh, and during execution, uh, we also would like to have that the workflow system schedules the jobs in a in a way that um, dependent nodes um, run after their parents, for example, and that you can execute them locally or distribute it on other computers or in the cloud. And therefore, many workflow systems, as you've seen, um, have emerged with different characteristics. They can be standalone, so such that they run on your computer um, without any, like with just with the installation of the software, of course. They might need a server, um, but can also be both, like can run either standalone or with a server, some, some of them. They might have different levels of visualization. Um, could be scripts only, um, or after you write the scripts, you can maybe uh, visualize it with a with the graph that it generates. But then there are also some of them that with which you can visually create the workflow and configure 
and then interactively um, also go through your results. Um, as I said, uh, for the execution, some of them can uh, distribute the work uh, on containers in the cloud uh, uh, with high performance computers or compute environments. And there are also some differences in if they just execute existing tools or if they provide own um, tools, which then we would call like an integration platform. So one example for such an integration platform that is also very visually and therefore um, we think relatively easy to learn um, would be Nine, which uh, is by now an industrial strength general purpose uh, workflow system. Uh, it's also it's also open source and um, available on all platforms. Um, yeah, what you what it looks like is that you you have your uh, little canvas here where you can drag and drop nodes that you install from some plugins onto your canvas. You connect them by dragging and dropping uh, arrows between them, so that they have dependencies between their files. Um, you can by double clicking you can configure them or look at their plots, and um, here you uh, organize your workflows and have a little overview down there with a the console log whenever you execute a tool, for example. Um, the data flow in Nine, for example, is um, that you can either pass tables or files between nodes and um, have specific configuration dialogues where you have the parameters uh, of the nodes listed and you can start and stop wherever you want in the workflow, execute parts of it, all of it, create sub workflows. And you also have some nodes for flow control, like loops, uh, if statements, try catch nodes. So it's basically a kind of visual programming language. Um, just to show you an example of uh, how you could do a mass spec related workflow with uh, Lime and OpenMS, uh, for example, if you have the task to identify peptides from multiple samples, um, you have as input some input files on the left that you can select uh, with a wildcard and uh, one database where you have your, for example, your whole proton in there that you want to search against. You want to reuse the database for uh, all of the files that are in here. So you loop only over the files that the, that contain your spectra and you do everything that's between those loop start and the loop end and uh, reuse the database and in the end you uh, put it into an output folder and have your results. In between you do uh, you use the OpenMS tools which like have these uh, ear icons and you do what uh, my predecessors explained to you uh, you do, for example, a database search. You do an indexing to look which are decoys and which are targets. You calculate the false discovery rate based on this. You filter for a, a, a certain score. Let it be a PAP, a posterior error pr probability or the false discovery rate. And um, you do that in an iterative manner because it's in the loop. Um, then another example for a, a script-based uh, workflow system, which is NextFlow. Um, it's, it's, to be honest, it's much easier like, to use NextFlow in a cloud environment if you're familiar with scripting, for example. Um, but depending on if, how familiar with scripting you are, it might, might be a, a little bit harder to learn. But the, uh, the language itself is pretty easy. Um, it consists of different processes that you um, specify. You give them a name. They have input channels and output channels that connect them between each other if they share a common file name, for example, um, or a common channel object. And um, you, can, uh, you have some when statements that execute processes uh, optionally. You can also specify wildcards in the channels and collect them at some point in the workflow, like the, the loop end that we saw. 
uh, with groovy statements, um, so-called operators. And uh, this is uh, actually very short to write uh, in groovy and might be an uh, option for you. Um, they also have very nice executors for on the cloud uh, for orchestrating containers and uh, therefore if you you're going for a high performance computing environment this might be a uh, better choice um, the dependency management for workflows is another thing to consider because you don't want people to install every single tool that your workflow needs by hand you would like to have it automatically. Um, some workflow systems like Nine, Galaxy, or Proton Discoverer, they're, they're so uh, enclosed, so, uh, so tightly uh, maintained that they actually do this uh, ma work dependency management internally. So whenever you install a plugin, it, it knows if it has dependencies on another, and it's always by the developers made sure that everything works together. Um, some other workflow systems like Nextflow, they depend on external management, um, which means that uh, in the best case, you use uh, some open source uh, managing software that has a public repository where you can download your tools or libraries that you need from uh, that is cross-platform. It's language agnostic because you usually want R scripts, you want Python scripts, you want C++ tools. And uh, if possible, it's also environment oriented so that you can, if you're working on one project and then the other, you can quickly switch. And what has been uh, well proven in bioinformatics is there, it's called Bioconda. It's uh, like a sub-channel of, of Anaconda, if you uh, heard about this. Um, it's, uh, it started Python based uh, for Python libraries and Python tools, but it's by now it's completely language agnostic. So you can also put your C++ tools there like we did. Um, you, the developers of the tools or people that would like to use the tools, um, they, in the community, they provide recipes on GitHub. Um, and so that all the dependencies are tested and resolved uh, just by typing, let's say, conda install OpenMS. And um, they also automatically generate so-called biocontainers, which are some self-contained environments that uh, have all the, the dependencies of one workflow, for example, or one tool packaged in uh, one so-called container. And that is what, for example, Nextflow makes use of. So Nextflow has uh, means to execute from containers. And since Bioconda, Bioconda can provide you with biocontainers for every tool, you can also directly uh, execute those biocontainers from Nextflow. Um, yeah, what are containers uh, in general? Uh, as I said, usually they are. Um, a bit simplistically uh, defined as lightweight virtual machines. Uh, and Docker, actually, uh, a quote from Docker, one of the uh, first, the first containerization engine, describes them as uh, a lightweight standalone executable package of software that includes everything needed to run an application. And that is actually what we like to have uh, for the users because it increases availability, because for example, you can have Docker on Windows. And um, if you've written your tool for Linux use only, that removes one barrier. Um, it limits the effect of an installation of a tool uh, and the execution of a tool also, and avoids something like dependency conflicts. If you have two tools that have different uh, versions of a library that they use, um, then you can install in two different containers and they don't have this conflict anymore. It improves reproducibility because whenever you ship your tool in a container, uh, all the dependencies stay in the same version, in the same environment. So whenever you execute it, you, will have, you should have the same uh, results. 
also if you deploy it on other systems uh, like in the cloud or high performance computers. Um, by now, there are actually multiple containerization engines um, that usually have differences in like security or how they ha um, handle their, uh, their interaction with the host system. But you should probably choose the one that's um, most suitable for you and the environment that you want to publish your tool to. Um, how do you make sure that the containers or the tools that you provide actually stay and um, are published in a fashion that they're actually usable by people. Um, I hope everyone is already doing uh, like source uh, version control source code and test driven development. And um, these days you can actually do a combination of both very easily. And I want to make like a little statement such that this maybe um, uh, like spreads the word a little bit more. So whenever you're already doing source code control, uh, version control on GitHub or Bitbucket, for example, um, it's just a few lines to, uh, to add what is, what is called like GitHub Actions or Travis, um, Circle CI, whatnot. And like you can test your code or your tools or even whole workflows, your containers um, on different platforms. And um, you can make sure that they run also after every edit that you make in your source code. Um, and it doesn't matter if it works, uh, even your tests, your hundreds of tests that you wrote, it doesn't help the user if it works on your machine. So you should um, try to test it on many different um, environments. And also uh, what you can do is you can request feedback from other developers if you do it, for example, on, on GitHub. Um, continuous deployment is just like another step uh, that it's, it's not about the source code anymore, but uh, about the actual artifacts that you deploy, your installers, your containers, your binaries. Uh, what you would like to have in the end is like a system like this, where if you're working with multiple people and um, like everyone contributes to your, to, to your code, which is actually what you would like to have, but then you have to set up some like gatekeeper, uh, like a Gandalf that doesn't let everything through. And I hope none of your pull requests will ever be as ugly as the barlog. But um, yeah, this is a mechanism to make sure that um, your code, uh, everything that you publish always runs. And if you give your code to a future developer because you finish your PhD, he will be happy because um, every change that he does, he will, he will right away be notified if it was a good change or not. <clears throat> um, one last thing about um, yeah, software maintenance, software development. You should also, after you created a tool, you should try to make it visible uh, for workflow creators um, that would like to use your tool. Of course, one thing is to make it as easily accessible as possible by providing it via, via many channels, which could be <clears throat> source packages for developers, containers for those workflow engines, in package managers, uh, uh, in installers for different um, platforms. Of course, I know um, that you might maybe don't have time to do all of them, but you could focus on uh, your um, like the people that you want to target, like your audience. Um, some workflow systems, if you integrate it in them, they automatically have some, some kind of hubs or tool sheds where they um, index all of the tools that are accessible from that workflow system. So if you put it in there, it will be automatically uh, findable by users in that workflow system at least. Um, you can also enter details about your tool in tool registries like BioTools or DocStore. Um, DocStore is actually uh, uh, a special case here because you can also provide example workflows there. And they also have executors for, um, for example, for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health Cloud uh, Infrastructure. 
um, but also uh, other um, workflow repositories are there. For example, the, there's my experiment or the next flow based uh, end of core uh, yeah, website, GitHub channel, GitHub page, um, where they actually maintain your work, try to maintain your workflow in a, uh, in a uh, reusable manner. Um, a little bit more details about OpenMS and PyOpenMS and how to use it. Um, OpenMS itself is um, built around the library that I mentioned in the, the first time I mentioned OpenMS. It's uh, a library that provides data structures for identification, quantification, visualization, um, and reading, writing data formats, and also some statistics. And build up on that, we uh, built those over 180 tools and also provide some uh, scripting um, extensions via Python wrappers that you can also use for scripting with the library or with the tools. Um, the tools themselves are also then, of course, av available in those workflow engines that I mentioned or also in vendor software like Proteum Discoverer, Compound Discoverer. Um, that is, the tools are actually the, the parts that our users usually see. They, um, the usual work, workflow for a user of OpenMS is that they, they build their workflow. Um, the intermediate parts of the workflow should be vis visualized in uh, top view, for example, to, to get a glimpse on your data and if the results make sense. And then there is some interaction between uh, the workflow. You make changes to your workflow if you see that your data looks correct, uh, or you make changes if it's not correct, and, and keep it if it's correct. And um, then you get your result data, which you uh, put into a public data repository like Pride. Uh, but also, uh, you should then publish your workflow in one of the workflow repositories that I mentioned. For developers, instead, um, they can directly use the library in C++ or Python. Um, we have all this um, continuous integration set up that I mentioned. Uh, so um, it, might, it might take a bit longer to get your stuff in there, but then you're sure that your stuff actually works. And um, you get reviews from all of the developers that are still active, uh, which sometimes have really good tips for you. Um, yeah, we also have annual uh, development retreats if you would like, if you're interested now and would like to join. And yeah, a little bit more I wanted to say about uh, our Python bindings. Uh, why did we decide to go through all this effort to provide these Python bindings, which are not a complete re-implementation, but a wrapping of our code. But the reason is that it's actually um, and I say this as a C++ developer, that it's non-trivial to learn it, um, <clears throat> or not as trivial as Python, at least, uh, in my opinion, because it has a relatively verbose syntax, sometimes depending on how you, uh, or how efficiently you want to um, develop, you sometimes need to do your own memory management, you have to, the compile step in between and manage all the dependencies, which is actually a pain in C++. Um, and that's why we thought we would do a good deed to our users, and de user developers, <laughs> developers that use OpenMS, um, to also offer Python bindings, because Python is uh, a relatively mature scripting language without this compilation step and much shorter syntax, uh, some syntactic sugars, and a lot of scientific libraries to use um, around uh, your program. Um, also, there are other mass spec libraries available that you can use and that they that can be used together with OpenMS. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's not a complete re-implementation in Python, which is also maybe not the wouldn't have been the most efficient uh, step for the execution of the code. Then, um, instead, we use Cython and AutoWrap to like automatically just wrap our data structures so that you have access to the C++ code from Python. 
So uh, in total, you, you have access to over 4,000 uh, C++ function calls from Python in a Pythonic way. Uh, you can use our readers and writers for the file formats. Uh, you have those, um, the library parts that I showed you about like, signal processing, identification, quantification, but you also have access to the complete tools. Um, so you're not limited to just using the library then. So you could actually uh, do your own mini workflows in Python. Um, it, it's, you have much more control uh, over what you, what you can use in Python. Um, you can do fast prototyping of algorithms that you can then, if you want, if it's, uh, if it's very critical for speed, you can then translate into C++ later if you want. You can do the same for data structures. You, you, uh, you prototype them and later maybe um, put them into C++ if you need pointers or you need memory, manual memory management. Um, and yeah, it integrates very well with other packages like PyMol, for example, if you um, want to visualize your proteins, your peptides, uh, your molecules in metabolomics, for example which is actually uh, one thing where we are currently um, actively developing in providing some more user interfaces in Python as well, uh, which I will get to in a minute. Um, like one very short example uh, is an example about monoisotopic weights and isotope patterns uh, that you can um, like generate from PyOpenMS. You can, you can generate such a sequence object from a string. You can, then it's one of our data structures that we also have that uh, beneath is the C++ data structure. And you can query the most important parts of this sequence. You can get its uh, mass to charge ratio. You can get its uh, monoisotopic weights. You can get suffixes uh, or prefixes. Um, and then also, uh, for example, isotope patterns. Um, this, for example, tells you that you want the first six most intense uh, isotopes uh, for this formula. Um, and what you get out in the end um, is something like this, which is a coarse isotope, isotope spectrum now. We also have support for fine isotopes from the isospec uh, algorithm that was uh, contribu contributed via the pull request mechanism that I mentioned, and it worked quite well. And um, yeah, this is a really short thing that you can do in 10 minutes, let's say, in Pi Um It uh, should also be very straightforward to install. You just type pip install or conda install Pi OpenMS. Um, we are currently restructuring this, so if it's uh, not working today, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> bear with me. Um, the, we have an online tutorial on read the docs that you can, uh, where, our, where we have a lot of snippets for what you could do with it. Uh, but you can always also reach out to one of our developers um, on the mailing list, GitHub, Gitter. And um, yeah, the thing that I mentioned, um, we are currently uh, actively extending our uh, GUI widgets in uh, Python. So if you're planning to do something in that regard, it's under active development. If you want to take part, um, you're happily invited, but you can also just wait for it to be finished and then use it in your Python program. Uh, for example, uh, spectrum visualization, um, uh, spectrum matches of ion matches, and the list of spectra here um, that you can easily assemble. Uh, those are separate widgets, PyQT. That's it. Um, if you have, we have further questions, I think the most straightforward way is to ask us during the meeting. But if you have questions later on, or if you just want to have a look at uh, the active development, you can go on GitHub or our website. And uh, you can also do a tutorial at home um, if you would like to do that and have some time.